Today's video is brought to you by Raycon. Are you ready to experience premium audio without breaking the bank? Well, look no further than Raycon. Raycon provides innovative earbud designs at affordable prices. Whether you're an audiophile or a casual listener, Raycon has the perfect audio solution for you. Now, whether you're looking for the everyday earbud, got these here, low latency gaming headphones, or a speaker with a battery that will last all night, Raycon has got you covered. And best of all, Raycon start at half the price of other premium audio brands. What sets Raycon apart from the rest? Well, for starters, they offer these everyday earbuds that come in a range of fun colors and patterns, and they are super comfortable. They've got a variety of fit options, but it's not just the design that make Raycon stand out. Their sound profiles are unmatched, offering everything from pure sound for podcast and audiobook listening to balance sound for those who are into a variety of music to bass sound for those who just love their strong beats so you can enjoy the perfect sound for any occasion plus it's very easy to navigate between the profiles you just hold the little l on the left earbud for about three seconds that'll toggle between those profiles they've got stereo sound of course passive noise isolation that blocks out background noise so you can enjoy your music or videos in peace. Plus, they're built to last, they're sweat and water resistance, eight hours of playtime, and in the charging case, it's 32 hours of battery life, so you can enjoy music all day, make all the calls you want, easy. Look, they've got 50,000 five-star reviews. There's no wonder that Raycon's everyday earbuds are a fan favorite. If you're worried about making the switch, Raycon's got you covered. They've got buy now, pay later options, and an easy, free, a return guarantee. Look, there are days when you know you need to work out on meditate, but the thought of it makes you want to crawl back into bed. So pop your Raycon's in your ears and choose a playlist that gets you pumped up for your workout, helps you relax for some meditation. The sound quality is amazing. You'll feel like you're in your own little world, free from distractions and interruptions. That's how Raycons can become a part of your routine. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash brain food to get 15% off your Raycon purchase today. And now today's video. An angry swan is more than capable of breaking an adult's arm if it feels threatened. Being out in cold weather can make you come down with a cold. Alcohol warms you up when it's chilly out and governments don't negotiate with terrorists. These are three examples of facts that most people wouldn't bat an eyelid at. They are passed off as a generally accepted truth. But how true is any of this? As the former items, we'll get to those later. But the main claim that we want to talk about today is whether or not governments negotiate with terrorists. It is indeed a fact that most governments have a policy against such, at least on paper. And the reasons for this should be pretty obvious. As soon as it is seen that the taking of hostages and either threatening or actually injuring or killing them results in demands being met, the result will doubtlessly be an immediate uptick in such events. After all, it will just prove that these atrocities suddenly become an effective way to get what you want. All of that being said, yeah, seemingly every single government actually does negotiate with terrorists most of the time, and terrorists the world over also very much know this, which kind of makes you wonder why anyone bothers to lie about it. This isn't to say government agencies always meet demands on some level, but to not even engage in dis course with terrorists to see if a beneficial outcome can be achieved would be kind of odd. On that note, if we take the policy of not negotiating with terrorists at face value, then it begs the question why agencies such as the FBI, the CIA, and the ATF have spent enormous amounts of money and time training expert negotiators. Some of these negotiators have even excelled in their work so much that they've become famous in their own right. Take Christopher Voss, author of the phenomenal book Never Split the Difference, where he outlines many examples of the FBI negotiating with terrorists of one form or another, which he knew all about Owing to being the one negotiating with his employment history, including 14 years on a terrorism task force, including a stint as the lead negotiator for the FBI. As one example, we have the kidnapping of journalist Jill Carroll, which occurred in 2006 while Voss was serving in the role as lead negotiator. Cooper was in Iraq when she was forced from her vehicle while attempting to visit a Sunni politician. Her translator was summarily executed by the roadside, but she was kept alive, held by a group that demanded the release of female prisoners in Iraq within three days. Ten days later, five prisoners were released from custody in a move that the military claimed was supposedly already planned. Jill, in turn, was released unharmed. Moving away from the United States' affairs, the UK government's position on hostage negotiations is described as follows on their own government website. We will not make substantive concessions. This includes paying ransoms, changing UK government policy, or releasing prisoners if hostage takers ask us to. That said, it is an open secret that the British government maintained contacts and channels for communications 
and facilitation of agreements with the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, from the height of their bombing campaign and beyond. The IRA, for their part, would tend to issue warnings before bombs were detonated so that there might be a chance of evacuation first in these areas. When the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 signaled the transition towards a more stable coexistence between the UK and the Republic of Ireland, it also involved the release of a number of paramilitary prisoners, many of whom had been convicted of causing countless deaths during the Troubles. Now, moving back across the ponds, in relatively recent years, America agreed to release several prisoners from their notorious Guantanamo Bay prison in exchange for Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, who had been captured by the Taliban and held for five years after deserting his post in 2009. Five Taliban prisoners were exchanged for Bo, and on his return to the US, he was court-martialed for desertion. The Iran-Contra affair between 1985 and 1987 is another example of the US government working with known terrorists, although it was essentially retconned after the fact to appear as though the point was to secure the release of several U.S. hostages, there were a number of elements that made it a huge scandal at the time. Iran was under an arms embargo, but the U.S. government supplied weapons to what they described as moderate elements in the country. They then used the money generated to fund the Nicaraguan Contras, who were a paramilitary group whose goals suited American interests at the time. Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North was at the center of the scandal when it broke, and despite what he did being technically treason, every major figure in involved eventually received a presidential pardon, and North currently works as a television host. While the government tried to paint the release of their prisoners as the end that justified the means, Reagan himself even admitted in the end that what had started as the sale of a few armaments had quickly deteriorated in its implementation into trading arms for hostages. In a more general and global scope, Al-Qaeda are said to have raised well in excess of $100 million through ransom payments alone. A report into these payments saw them made from a number of different countries, but rarely directly channeling the money through less obvious entities in order to mark the fund's origins and purpose. In the report, the countries that made these payments are not specified, but they are described as mainly European. On this note, in addition, despite the fact that representatives from Russia, Canada, the United States of America, Japan, the UK, France, Germany, and Italy all signed an accord in 2013 agreeing to not pay ransoms, it is well understood that most, if not all of them, have at some point either broken this directly or implicitly by complying with non-monetary demands in exchange for various concessions. Although, on the flip side, in the case of damned if you do and damned if you don't, the Japanese government refused to meet a ransom demand issued by ISIL in 2015, which resulted in the execution of two of their citizens. Kenji Goto was a video journalist who insisted on returning to the war zone in Syria in an attempt to facilitate the release of his countryman, Haruna Yakawa. He was captured almost immediately by ISIL, and when the Japanese government refused to pay the ransom of $200 million, Yakawa was beheaded. Goto was then forced to be photographed holding Yakawa's severed head. Next, he was made to record audio blaming his government's non-cooperation for the execution. Despite intercession on his behalf by a number of agencies, the Japanese authorities wouldn't pay the ransom or facilitate the release of a held ISIL prisoner to secure Goto's freedom. Shortly after, he too sadly met his death at the hands of his captors. The execution was captured on video and distributed. So this all brings us around to one of the more hardline countries in Russia and how they deal with terrorists. The Russian government is not the sort of regime that would compromise its policies or make concessions in very many cases. When it came to the acts of terrorism that mainly stemmed from the two Chechen wars, these were attributes that did not change. The results were as tragic as they were predictable. With demands often calling for the end of the war, the recognition of Chechnya as an independent state, and the release of many warlords, it could easily be argued that the terrorists themselves knew they were never going to get what they wanted. The Moscow theater crisis in October 2002 was an especially horrendous affair when terrorists took an astonishing 850 civilians hostage. Over the course of a number of days, negotiations faltered and eventually failed, leading to Russian forces pumping gas in through the vent system before storming the building. Despite endless obstacles being put in the way of investigations and refusal to identify what was used, it was eventually discovered that the fumes were fentanyl derivatives. When the dust settled, 170 people lost their lives. In the Beslan school siege of September 2004, the terrorists attacked a school, taking hostages and rigging the place with explosives that they hung from the basketball hoops in the gymnasium, along with apparent dead man switches that they stood on, which would detonate if they moved, discouraging sharpshooters from sniping them. Once again, attempts at mediation fell down, and assault began on the school, consisting of Russian forces, police, and groups of local civilians, many of whom had relatives in the school, who had armed themselves. 
The end result was more than 330 deaths, more than half of them children and 31 hostage takers dead. When postmortems were carried out, it was revealed that many of the terrorists had taken truly monumental doses of various drugs such as methamphetamine and morphine, allowing them both to focus and simultaneously ignore injuries so they were better equipped to fight to the death. Russia introduced tougher laws around terrorism and hostage taking following this, and after a change of leadership within the Chechen ranks, attacks on civilians were for the most part halted. In the end, any government that doesn't comply or try to make a deal which results in their citizens tortured or murdered by terrorist groups generally sees them criticized for allowing such acts when they could have been prevented via various means such as prisoner exchange and the like. On the other hand, meeting demands brings more exposure and paints a similar target on other citizens. There is nothing more appealing to the average terrorist than a nearly guaranteed payday. This conundrum is what paints governments into a corner when it comes to these situations and demonstrates why, when you peek behind the curtain, most countries have actually negotiated and met the demands of terrorists when the pros outweighed the cons, just usually not overtly. So. That's governments. What if any of the policies that companies and organizations hold when it comes to negotiating with terrorists? Seemingly pretty similar for the most part to governments. Try to prevent such from happening in the first place whenever possible, and otherwise, when it does anyway, negotiate to see if an outcome can be achieved where the pros outweigh the cons while doing everything possible to not make things too public if a deal is struck. As an example, during the peak of the Somalian pirate activity in the Gulf of Aden, many of the ransoms were paid to secure the safe return of captured ships and a release of crews by shipping companies. While private companies have a little more leeway and motivation to meet demands, they also try to keep the information from the public. The total amount of ransoms paid to Somalian pirates is estimated to be in the realm of $340 million at the low end and in excess of $400 million at the top. When most of the pirates come from highly impoverished backgrounds with little prospects to support themselves and their families, these sums of money are often more than enough to make the risk to themselves worth it. In response, in terms of preventative measures, what most of the shipping companies did was implement relatively primitive security measures by running razor wire over the aft of their vessels, which tends to be the easiest access point, and run fire hoses pointing downward toward the water to hamper attempts to board via ladders or grappling hooks. A more robust deterrent came in the form of employing armed guards, civilian contractors who were all ex-military and brought weaponry with them onto the vessels. If a vessel was approached, then it rarely took more than a guard holding their rifle above their head from the bridge to deter the would-be pirates. After all, who wants to get shot when the Suez Canal has around 70 ships passing through it every single day, and there will be another one along shortly, possibly without such defenders. Private citizens are no more safe from the catch-22 of how to respond to a hostage demand. One of the most famous cases concerned Paul Getty in 1957, when he was the richest man in the world, with an estimated net worth of nearly $10 billion, or about $110 billion in today's money. His grandson was kidnapped at the age of 16, and when presented with their ransom note for $17 million, Getty initially refused. He wouldn't even take calls from his daughter, trying to talk him into paying, instead speaking on record to reporters and giving the following quote, I have 14 other grandchildren, and if I pay one penny now, then I will have 14 kidnapped grandchildren. Eventually, when the young man's ear was posted to Getty and his family as both a threat and proof of life, he relented, however, and paid. Well, he paid exactly $2.2 million. The remainder of the cash was in the form of a loan to his son, the victim's father, and Getty expected it to be paid back with interest. Going back to governments, in the end, while outcomes vary considerably from case to case, the reality seems to be that in most cases, governments will negotiate with terrorists. But what they won't do is pay ransoms. Except the times that they decide it's worth it, but then it'll almost always be very indirect, so it can at least be somewhat plausibly denied or covered up. On top of this, uh, they won't release prisoners in exchange for others. Well, except when they decide that it's worth it, given the specifics of the situation. And they certainly won't sell arms or give them to countries illegally in order to earn hostage releases, except when, well, you begin to get the idea. For what it's worth, it is most certainly true that being cold doesn't inherently make you catch a cold. Old swans can't break your arm directly, regardless how strong or violent they are, owing to the fact that their bones are much more brittle than yours by a good margin. I mean, I suppose they can make you fall down and break something, but otherwise, no. And finally, drinking alcohol not only will not warm you up when it's cold out, but it'll actually do the opposite and make you quite cold quite quickly, making it doubly dangerous. You're welcome. Thanks for watching.